Hello, this is Mark Uncover, Executive Director of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association, and welcome to our webinar, uh, Value-Added Pipeline Applications Using High Fidelity Fiber Optic Monitoring and Machine Learning. And uh, we're very pleased to have with uh, us one of the uh, one of the leaders within uh, FOSA, Steve Coles, who is the president and CEO of Hi-Fi Engineering. Uh, and he is joining us from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, Steve, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, appreciate the introduction and um, uh, very excited to be back doing our second uh, FOSA webinar from a couple of years ago. Uh, as Mark mentioned, we're gonna be talking a lot about pipeline applications today but more specifically around other applications above and beyond leak detection that we can use with high fidelity fiber optic sensing, and then more specifically how we process that data using machine learning software algorithms. Uh, we'll start by doing a little bit of overview of the company for those who don't know uh, much about HiFi. Uh, we'll then bridge into talking a little bit about unique approaches to fiber optic sensing for pipelines uh, around fidelity, performance, deployment, and a few other things. Uh, we'll talk then a little bit about machine learning and artificial intelligence and what that actually means to the data sets that we manage on behalf of our pipeline operating partners. And then bridge into a variety of application case studies. We will touch a little bit about uh, leak detection, uh, but try to spend more time on uh, other value-added applications such as strain-related, uh, pig-related, and flow monitoring-related uh, uh, applications. As a little bit of background on HiFi, uh, we've been around since 2007. Uh, we are based in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, we are a technology service provider as a fiber optic sensing technology uh, player. We've got a significant amount of experience in the energy sector. Uh, part of our investor base includes Synovus, uh, a large EMP company, Enbridge, obviously a large uh, pipeline company, and more recently BDC as a uh, financial investor. Uh, we provide a turnkey approach to pipeline monitoring and pipeline safety through a variety of uh, high fidelity sensors as well as machine learning based software. Uh, we've been a proud member of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association now for a couple of years, proud to also be on the board of directors. Uh, we have uh, a significant amount of investment in in-house technology. We have over 60 patents covering both our interferometry and a variety of the other applications that we focus on in the pipeline space. We've used the technology uh, in other applications, predominantly, again, oil and gas uh, related, uh, where we've proven out its scalability and robustness in things like downhole environments, where we've licensed the technology to service providers and have supported over a thousand well bores. I wanted to start just a little bit around the approach to achieving higher fidelity performance or signal to noise ratio. Certainly a significant challenge in uh, providing and maximizing this fidelity and performance, especially over long distances like with pipelines. Now, I want to be very respectful here of our other FOSA members. There are multiple approaches to what's called interferometry. Many of the FOSA, member, FOSA members use backscattering oriented techniques like Raleigh, uh, which are perfectly acceptable and very well positioned in our mind with various specific applications. In fact, HiFi started uh, over 10 years ago in backscattering using conventional DAS and DTS. However, given our specific focus on pipelines, we just didn't find that these interferometries had the applicable sensing performance that we required. And as a result, we worked on a different patented approach to our interferometry. And that is where we actually use uh, both a combination of a fiber brag grading and dense wave division multiplexing and time division multiplexing uh, to improve the performance on the sense specialized sensing fiber, where we actually inscribe FBGs right into the core of the glass, allowing us to control the wavelength and the amount of light that are reflected. Now, uh, FBGs have been used for years in other applications and other vertical markets, uh, military, healthcare. Um, typically, they're actually used as a point sensor. Uh, but however, fiber brag gratings can also be used as a controllable wavelength filter that allows us uh, to use them as a low angle reflector and create a phase modulated cavity for interferometry. The result is a fully distributed sensor, so we're sensing every centimeter uh, of the asset like a pipeline, but it actually creates a great uh, platform for very long distances, uh, namely for, uh, for pipeline with very excellent linear consist consistency and performance. 
It also provides for a very integrated approach uh, to interrogation, so both the acoustics, temperature, and strain of vibration all in very high fidelity um, and um, uh, helps us really position uh, HiFi to solve very specific problems, uh, namely around pipelines. So what are those problems? Uh, really, you can think about it as very simply as space and time. Uh, the pipeline industry has always been challenged around needing more advancements and intelligence around their sensing capabilities. Uh, a variety of different approaches, of course, have been used for years in the pipeline area. Uh, point sensors, whether that be mass balance sensors or computational um, uh, measures between flow meters, geophones, microphones, uh, negative pressure wave monitors or callers have been used in the past, all of which have a challenge around having the sufficient resolution and precision um, in terms of uh, being able to identify where a potential uh, event has actually been uh, 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 determined. Uh, other approaches to complement this include periodic surveys, whether those are literally manual inspections, uh, integrity digs, there's use of drones or helicopters, inline inspection tools. The problem with these, of course, is that may na they may not be deployed at the actual right time. So we always have this situation, if you're not at the right place at the right time, you have the potential of missing an event, or if you have a challenge with the um, performance of uh, your sensing, you can create false positives. So there's always gonna be doubt uh, in pipeline operations unless we can solve this space and time uh, dilemma. And really the challenge that we've uh, focused on is the complexity of how do we can achieve 100% coverage in terms of what we're sensing, uh, all of the in real time, and get to 100% assurance and ultimately 100% confidence. So enter the world of specialized fiber optics, but they're used as a high fidelity and distributed sensing platform uh, for, uh, for pipeline monitoring. Um, it's not just a key that we have to be fully distributed here, but that we also are integrated at a system level in high fidelity of both uh, temperature, acoustics, vibration, and strain, all in very, very high resolution. So you can see a resolution here of being accurate to 0 0.001 degrees Celsius in temperature, a uh, broad range of acoustics, uh, micrometer resolutions on vibration and strain. All of this allows for us to be able to dive much deeper in terms of the data set and provide closer to 100% assurance and confidence of what we're actually providing to our pipeline uh, operating partners. Now, admittedly, this is a bit of a commercial slide, but we'll uh, we'll go, go through it and then move more onto the application case studies. Um, as mentioned, uh, HiFi used to be in the conventional DAS and DTS sensing world, uh, but instead focused uh, with our pipeline strategy on improving the performance. So we really did redesign the whole system from the sensors, interrogation platforms, software, all to be unique around high fidelity, uh, which really helps on providing machine learning based sensing without a focus really on using telecom kind of related uh, techniques and, uh, and technologies. We operate with one integrated system, one sensing fiber, um, and uh, we've done uh, the deployment in a way that allows us to achieve much longer distances uh, than uh, traditional methods and support a variety of other applications uh, that um, really can effectively leverage machine learning, can eliminate false positives, and support that you know, goal of being more 100% on accuracy and provide more intelligent decision making around what we call preventative uh, pipeline leak detection and, and other applications. Now, uh, we just announced uh, yesterday actually a couple uh, pieces to our portfolio. Uh, one is what we call our HDS 2.0. Uh, platform, uh, which improves some of our uh, uh, tracking on strain and temperature. Uh, we've improved our some of our optical uh, applications to achieve longer distances. Uh, included a much more rugged design on some of the hardware to support in very remote locations in some cases, and then improved our ability to remotely operate um, and uh, and support those platforms. We've also launched what we call HDS Monitor software. This is our new uh, control room software which has an improved user experience, is scalable to bigger data architectures and includes data stitching and edge computing capability. Uh, helps to streamline uh, pipeline operators that have multiple pipelines that they're using to uh, uh, um, manage through the single inter integrated interface. We've improved some uh, geospatial capability in context to clustered type of events, um, improved ability to do historical event analysis and reporting, and then ultimately keep uh, created capabilities for new events 
and features such, a, such as uh, pig detection tracking and analysis and others including things like flow monitoring. The way we want to think about how our technology works is really into three clusters or, or three categories. Um, the first being, and we've already talked a little bit about this in terms of the actual specialized fiber optic sensor itself. Uh, as mentioned, it's designed for long distances on pipelines uh, and uh, for high fidelity sensing. And so it's deployed with the pipeline itself. You can see here in the image, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about here deployment in a, in a couple of moments. The second component really then becomes the system hardware. Um, and this is what provides our, our computational uh, capability to process, you know, a fairly significant amount of data. Uh, we have deployments where we are processing upwards of 10 terabytes um, a day across hundreds of kilometers. That creates quite a challenge in terms of data managing. And as I mentioned, things like stitching together data and providing edge analytics. The third component of our, of our technology is probably the, the biggest part of the secret sauce, if you will, and gonna be a big topic of conversation as part of this presentation. And that is really around our software algorithms. And so these include a variety of uh, AI, machine learning based algorithms uh, that are looking for leak detection or other anomalies, uh, such as flow and other types of events. And then this also includes our new control room software that I just referenced in terms of presenting these events in real time into the control room of the pipeline operator so that they can take action as, uh, as appropriate. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about deployments. Uh, I often, well, when you used to be able to go to cocktail parties and events, uh, as you describe as people do, what we do for a living, one of the first questions that always comes up with people is, okay, I think I understand what fiber optics are. How, how do you actually deploy what I envision something very fragile uh, to be deployed with uh, pipeline infrastructure where there's big heavy machinery and big piping, it, you know, very industrial. Um, and so it's important to understand sort of the different approaches to deployment that we support. And they really are simply one of three, uh, both external on the pipe deployment, external near the pipe deployment, and then actually internal or inside the pipe uh, deployment. Uh, the first is the uh, uh, name would suggest external uh, on the pipe deployment. And I have some images here I'll show you uh, um, shortly where we actually provide the secure fiber sensor in a HDPE electrical conduit that's actually secured directly on the pipe. And we actually have partnered with Duraline with their uh, multipath path um, uh, um, uh, product offering and we'll secure that directly uh, to the pipe you can see the image up here being secured around the 12 o'clock position the orange conduit typically that is uh, deployed empty and we can in inject fiber um, after the fact uh, once construction is uh, is completed and we can inject using an air method or also a liquid injection uh, type of method as well obviously most applicable for new construction um, and as a very economical way of getting sensing deployed uh, once, uh, of course, trenches are open and available for deployment. The second is very related in terms of still being external to the pipe, but what we call near the pipe deployment, uh, where uh, we can still be in a situation where there, it is a new build, but there be, might be multiple pipes actually in, the, uh, in a common trench that we're looking to sense collectively. Or, as you can see by the image here, the idea of more intelligent micro-trenching to retrofit on existing pipelines uh, is extremely important and extremely exciting area uh, for advancement on being able to retrofit and protect older pipelines. And then similar uh, from a uh, retrofit perspective, we can actually also leverage a little bit of our downhole experience by going inside the pipe and supporting internal deployment, where we would protect the fiber sensor in a stainless steel capillary tube. Um, and very similar to downhole, we would use a, a downhole injector, uh, often a pack off assembly, and even a tow pig that pushes and pulls the line into place for short distances where we've got high consequence areas like a river crossing, uh, an environmental zone or otherwise. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this in, in another slide where we talk about tow pigging uh, versus uh, being able to leverage uh, the internal deployment uh, for inline inspection and, uh, and otherwise cleaning pigs. Here's a couple just examples, as I'd mentioned, of on the pipe, obviously, and near the pipe type of deployments. Uh, the example actually here on the left is actually from the Trans Mountain Pipeline, uh, which is actually one of the largest construction projects currently um, going on, uh, about a thousand kilometers. They've given us actually approval to use this image. You can actually see that nice, pretty open trench, uh, the green coated pipe, 
I think this is a 36 inch uh, transmission pipeline and you can actually see the orange Duraline uh, conduit that uh, is being uh, deployed and secured at the 12 o'clock position on this specific pipe. Um, the other example here is what we'll call near the pipe deployment. Uh, again, we've got multiple pipes in the trench. It's not uncommon in the Western Canadian Basin to have say a heavy oil line here on the right hand side and a diluent return line on the other side of the trench. And you can see where we're using the same Duraline conduit down the middle uh, of the trench. And that allows us actually to sense because we have such high signal to noise ratio, we can actually sense both pipes at the same time. Um, and it becomes a very uh, economical way of providing sort of multi-asset uh, type of uh, support. Uh, we also, uh, of course, need to be able to support trenchless methods uh, of, uh, of deployment. Uh, these are obviously important if we're going to be tipped tail on any sort of pipeline uh, construction. Many trenchless deployments include the most uh, common is horizontal directional drilling or uh, boring, uh, where what we've actually done from a configuration perspective is use multiple conduits uh, for added redundancy. There's really, these are one and done type of uh, procedures where we'll actually connect uh, multiple uh, conduits uh, to the pull head. You can actually see images here. Uh, we have the um, uh, the boring tool and the pullback assembly uh, for this uh, uh, this pipe will literally pull back pipes under river crossings, uh, highways, environmental zones where they don't want or don't uh, aren't able uh, to support uh, trench-based uh, traditional trench-based uh, me methods. And so we'll connect multiple conduits for redundancy to the pull head. In some cases, for longer pulls, uh, we'll use things like stainless steel capillary tubes as well. I think the longest uh, we have been involved in terms of pulls are around 2,100 meters, uh, which is actually very long from an HDD perspective. Uh, it's not just HDD, there's other, it's the most common trenchless method, but there are other trenchless methods around direct pipe, slip pipe, pipe and pipe, um, and others that are used as part of uh, construction. And while we are a technology company, being versed in these techniques is very, very important. Again, if we're going to create tip to tail 100% coverage on uh, on our pipelines. And then uh, finally, a few images here around internal deployment, a little uh, uh, sketch showing exactly what we're talking about in terms of deploying the fiber inside uh, the um, uh, the pipeline and monitoring from the inside. We can obviously, uh, um, this is an example of a, a pack off assembly uh, beside a flange uh, coming into a, a, a pig launching station. Uh, you can see another example down here where we have sort of a 45 degree ingress point. Um, and then this is an example of the tow pig that we use where we're connecting to the stainless steel line with a release assembly that allows us again to push and pull uh, the uh, the line into place for high consequence areas. Again, existing pipelines of a river crossing, environmental zones, uh, state or national parks. And this really does leverage a lot of uh, high fives downfall experience uh, on deployment of uh, similar types of uh, engagements around thousands of wells. Now, as mentioned, one of the key challenges around internal deployment, of course, is what about pigging the pipelines? And there's different types of pigging. Running an inline inspection tool, which is not done often, say once a year, uh, we have the ability to retract uh, the uh, uh, the sensing line out of place, uh, run the uh, pig, and then reinsert uh, the, the sensor itself. Uh, for cleaning pigs, of course, that's not as practical. Um, and so we are working on uh, different innovations here where we may actually have an ability to have p uh, cleaning pigs and the fiber optic sensor being able to coexist in the line without having to remove it. Anyway, so that's a little bit about uh, deployment. Now I'm actually going to switch gears quite a bit and talk about software and talk about machine learning. There's certainly a lot of buzz around AI and machine learning in every industry right now. Uh, many people talk about doing them, but don't necessarily dive deep in terms of describe discreetly what they're doing, how they support, and, and at what level. And so I just want to start with some fairly generic uh, uh, instances here where we can talk about AI and what it's actually meant to be, which is, of course, the ability to have machines that can perform tasks in a way that are intended to be more and more intelligent. Um, but there's different levels of that, of course. Um, there's then the subset within AI, what we call machine learning, and then moving into uh, deep learning or reinforcement learning as well, where the ability is looking at um, machines or computers that can process data and actually learn on their own. Um, now, there's also the, the differentiation of what you know consumers are used to with uh, what we call weak or narrow AI, 
And you can think about this as the, you know, the Alexas of the world or Google Homes, where you've got a lot of nested Boolean logic, uh, very generic, very predictable though, and very repeatable. Um, but what we do to get into here is broader than that, where you're getting into stronger AI, where algorithms actually can adapt and potentially make different decisions on very similar data based on very subtle uh, differences in the data set itself. So that gets into a broader piece here, a deeper piece, what, what we'll call machine learning. And there's a couple of different traditional approaches around machine learning. Uh, the first being uh, what I'll call supervised uh, learning, uh, where you are actually creating models that are both correlating the input and output data sets. It's kind of like starting with a little bit of the answer key, but there's a tremendous amount of regression analysis and different approaches to classification of in inputs and outputs that take a lot of computational resources and repetitions. Now, the other approach uh, being more um, unsupervised learning, where there is quite a bit of uh, a significant amount of clustering and dimension reduction where you don't know the data set and there's a variety of different techniques that you're looking to apply against um, not knowing the output conditions necessarily, but only being able to rely on the input conditions. What we've actually done at, um, at HiFi is, a, is supporting a variety of different uh, pieces from a leak detection perspective. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of leak signatures that we have in a database that we use supervised learning uh, through decision tree type of class, uh, classifiers, uh, neural network, computational neural networks that support vectoring and classifications. Uh, again, very good for large data sets in, uh, in real time. As I mentioned at the top of the, of the presentation is beyond leak detection, other value added, application, value added applications. And this is actually where we use a variety of different unsupervised uh, approaches to machine learning on these operating conditions to support other uh, applications. And you'll hear me talk a little bit about uh, function fitting which is a regression uh, attempt at fitting predictive formulas into a data set to, to estimate something else like flow. Um, and so, uh, and then we also have a variety of other, so we'll call it non-leak uh, events that we have in a variety of databases that allow us, us to support this more preventative type of situation where we can use supervised learning on event detection that don't have that doesn't have anything really to do with specific leaks, and so uh, again, that has a lot of training and testing associated with it, uh, given it being more of a supervised uh, approach. Now, what's interesting about all this? There's lots of different approaches to um, uh, machine learning. These are the ones that we've taken. Uh, what is interesting is while HiFi is a you know distributed fiber optic sensing company, the reality is we actually have almost more of our system engineering staff focused on machine learning based software development. Uh, than just optical. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, leak detection and then we'll move on to uh, other applications. Um, in doing so I want to differentiate a couple of different uh, elements of nomenclature uh, that are typically out there. Um, internal versus external um, uh, leak detection, internal using internal operating components of, um, uh, of operating the pipeline for leak detection. Flow meters is a good example of that. External being external sensors like fiber optics, of course, uh, fitting into that. But even within, we've got direct and indirect uh, terms that are often thrown around a bit and we want to distinguish a little bit. Of course, indirect is a approach where we're inferring a leak through other sensing anomalies, either in flow or pressure, that are associated with the leak indirectly themselves. And so mass balance systems have been used on this. There's been a lot of talk about negative pressure waves. You know, these indirect methods do have their kind of pros and cons. Mass balance systems do have high thresholds and have very difficult time of pinpointing an exact location of an event. Uh, negative pressure wave can be effective for triggering the start of a leak. Uh, unfortunately, they don't work with gas environments. They don't work very well in batchy environments, uh, start stops, if you will, uh, even in, on the liquid side, where you can easily trigger false alarms. And they're also not as effective, of course, in detecting an ongoing leak if the start of the leak was actually missed. We feel that direct is the most appropriate for extremely small and low level leaks, uh, although our algorithms can support indirect methods as well as a complement. Um, and so in some of HiFi's independent blind testing that we've done on the direct method, um, and we've been, look, we've been uh, tested on a, a variety of different pro, uh, pipe types, steel, concrete coated, composite, uh, polymer designed pipes, product types, liquids, gas, multi-phase, 
um, water um, and a variety of other environments, uh, external, including subsea, where we were actually reliably down to 0.1 liter of fluid leaked at 0.1 liters per minute with zero false positives. I think the, the smallest leak that we detected in some of the testing was 0.7 millimeter orca size at 6 PSI, where it was actually arguable whether there was a physical release of the actual product in there. Um, so we felt that uh, our direct method of, of, uh, of focus has really been uh, um, effective uh, and is a method that actually can support a part of a broader portfolio strategy, uh, such as with API 1175 on, on leak detection. Uh, moving ahead uh, here on to uh, the next slide on just showing some examples of, of leak detection. Uh, the one here on the left uh, is really more about a rupture. Uh, where we've got a very large event uh, that we can pick up both in acoustics here on the bottom of the graph as well as strain from the pipe. The pipe is under pressure moving from product from A to B and a large leak happens or even a small leak for that matter, the pipe under pressure is going to move in the opposite direction. So that correlated factor of strain and uh, even very saturated acoustics from this rupture, rupture are very important to correlate together. Um, as we, uh, as we look at uh, detecting these type of events. Now, rupture detection can be detected by a variety of other methods, uh, including indirect, of course, but of course, it's never that easy. Here, this is an example here, and you can see here from the acoustic um, frequency plot below, we have a very busy field. Uh, we have pump jacks moving, we have machinery moving, we have an intersecting pipeline that is flowing across the pipeline. And then in this example, the operator simulated a very, very small leak uh, above sort of the ambient uh, kind of level that uh, of acoustics we were being picked up. And we were just focusing on acoustics only. This is a very easy event to have missed. Whereas if we can correlate that with the strain on the pipe that is uh, correlated with the exact same timing of that event, provides us greater confidence, confidence I should say, uh, and allows us then to provide this as an alarm back to the operator in real time for them to be able to take uh, appropriate action and follow their appropriate leak detection procedure. Now, I said we'd talk uh, about uh, um, other things in leak detection, and so we're now gonna bridge into a variety of other uh, applications and examples uh, around using machine learning and how that actually helps in providing greater value add. Um, the first one I'm actually gonna show is kind of interesting in that this is an example of train identification using supervised machine learning. This is actually around image processing of the, in this case, the frequency of, acoustic frequency of a train. Now, as you can imagine, when a train is running close to a pipeline right of way, it's gonna create a lot of um, uh, acoustics in terms of uh, uh, amplitude, specific frequency, a specific speed, and a lot of otherwise interference that may impact leak detection uh, procedures and, uh, and, uh, and other algorithms. So what we actually do here is we have an algorithm that runs that allows us to detect a train very successfully. In fact, the, the machine learning algorithm is kind of illustrated here in pink. The real train data is what's exhibited here in red. And so the algorithm says, aha, this is a train. I know what this looks like. Now, why do we do that? We don't do that to alarm back to the operator that a train is going by the right of way. That's normal operating behavior and activity for the train itself, uh, for the pipeline itself, I should say. What we do though is we use this as a uh, ability to remove uh, the train data from the other algorithms, namely the leak detection algorithms. Kind of think about it as noise canceling headphones. We remove this data so that the leak detection algorithms are running and don't get confused or interfered with the mass amount of data that's actually coming from the train. So uh, again, this isn't a customer facing application, but this is an application example that allows us to be that much more discreet and that much more confident on potential leak alarms that aren't being interfered with in terms of the data set that's coming from other events. Uh, moving through other examples, we're doing a lot of work in uh, detecting geotechnical events. Those could be landslides, hillside sloughing, or of course, earthquakes. Uh, we're actually very effective at detecting earthquakes from fairly far away. This is an example an earthquake was actually picked up around Helena, Montana. Uh, the closest deployment that we had uh, very close to this was about 300 kilometers away in southern Alberta. You can see by the map here. The earthquake uh, event uh, occurred, it was 5.2 on the Richter scale at the epicenter. It had um, 
uh, subsided to about a 3.0, about 300 kilometers away, but we were still able, the sensor was still able to hear the ground moving and feel the ground moving, both the earthquake event that happened at, you'll notice the timestamp here at 12.30, as well as an aftershock that occurred uh, about five minutes later. This did represent a, a shutdown situation uh, for the uh, pipeline, so I'll call it a preventative situation. Site inspection did find major fissures in the slope, and yet thankfully the um, uh, the pipeline itself was uh, was undamaged. Uh, but it was definitely an example of this preventative type of leak detection. We we're focused on other events like geotechnical. That's actually uh, fed very well into a lot of work that we're doing on slope stability monitoring. So this is actually the same location. You can see a steep hill here and the fissure that was uh, created by the earthquake uh, at the time. This is a unique deployment where we actually have two sensing fibers in the right of way where and there's a pipeline buried down this slope. Um, and so we have uh, one fiber that's actually on the pipe where it's buried at three meters, um, and then another pipe uh, in the ground that's buried at one meter. So we have quite a bit of differentiation here between what we'll call pipe movement and as well as ground movement. And so we can actually plot, and it's fairly short, so we actually come down the hill, loop back, and come back up. Um, what that allows us to do is plot both ground movement, in the case of this graph, as well as then pipe movement. And because this loops back and forth, we can actually uh, track both the speed of the uh, earthquake, even though this is a, a short deployment, but it's actually propagating from the bottom of the hill, in this case, to the top of the hill. And it's a very, call it universal uh, situation here, where we're seeing the same amount of activity at the ground level as well as on, uh, on the pipe level. Now, what we've actually done, this is a good example of a one-time situation. We can actually do uh, you know, long-term monitoring on this same deployment where we can then accumulate strain over time. And so these are two examples of those same fiber sensors over two months of data, where we've got the pipe fiber down here below on these graph. You can see then the separation and the ground fiber above. And you can actually see very distinct differences between ground movement and pipe movement in terms of cumulative strain over that period. What's also interesting is that it's dynamic. This month is not the same as this month. While in both cases, thankfully, there's not a lot of pipe movement in terms of strain, but the ground is moving differentially. Uh, this type of data, very, very valuable to pipeline integrity management professionals. In this case, uh, they were able to correlate this very heavily with rainfall. Uh, meaning at the front end of this month, there was more rainfall making the ground heavier and actually creating more strain on itself than the secondary month uh, that um, uh, where the rainfall was later in the month and created the same type of uh, signature. So again, very valuable data from uh, an integrity management perspective uh, that allows uh, pipeline professionals to be able to really understand the long-term impacts and operations of um, uh, of their operations from uh, uh, from using of the, the fiber optic sensors. Um, very important from a strain monitoring perspective uh, in examples like this, uh, where we've got this expansion loop designed uh, to be able to contract uh, and expand due to thermal changes and other ground movement. You can actually see, again, where we have our uh, orange conduit uh, uh, secured at the 12 o'clock position on this specific pipe. And we can actually monitor ongoing strain on this uh, pipe as well. So this is actually a longer uh, example where this chart on a 3D basis is showing a month of data um, specific by um, uh, channels or segments of the pipeline. And we're plotting what the real cumulative data is that is uh, cumulative daily uh, and comparing that against the baseline or this red line, which we're actually showing is what is normal uh, strain on this pipeline over uh, periods of time. And you know, as you'll know, pipelines are designed to move, inclusive of that uh, expansion uh, loop. Uh, but what's interesting about looking at this on a cumulative basis rather than on a, uh, on a one-time basis is that you can see here towards the end of this month, we're actually seeing where that expansion loop is, quite a bit of si significant accumulative cumulative strain over and above the normal baseline. Um, and that is very valuable uh, data back to uh, the operator. Now we're showing here combined tension and compression. We can show this with polarity, uh, but that was just not deemed as part of important with this specific uh, uh, application. So you can see monitoring strain has become a big part of our uh, business in terms of uh, uh, distributed nature of, uh, of what we do. Next application I wanted to move into is uh, pig detection, pig tracking, and analysis. Um, so as you can probably be well aware, pipeline operators use 
uh, pigs, like cleaning pigs like this one, or inline inspection tools that are more crawling based, uh, and they run through their pipelines quite blind in terms of not knowing where those are. But of course, these pigs will give off very interesting signatures that are very um, effectively tracked and picked up uh, from a distributed sensing perspective, especially if you have high fidelity. These pigs will actually cause vibrations as they scrape through weld joints. In this case, we are actually picking them up at uh, weld joints every 60 feet uh, that produce a very specific and unique signature that allow us even to drill down digitally and see, in this case, the four cups of this cleaning pig scraping through those weld joints individually. With that and using machine learning algorithms, we can actually track this quite well um, and the ability not just to find the direction of travel, but in some cases, we actually are able to pick up the pig in this case, we were 15 kilometers away from where the sensor was de uh, deployed uh, as the, uh, the, the, the data is proper, sorry, the strain on vibration on the pipe is propagating up the pipe. And then we can actually plot that, this is a very early version, but plot that on a map for the operator to show where that actually pig is, uh, is in any given time. Pigs actually have a, a instance of often they will actually get stuck. And if you're operating blind, not knowing where they actually are becomes a very costly and significant problem. Here we've actually created a quick little video uh, showing uh, a um, pig location and speed tracking against flow and then a map. Now I appreciate this will look very manual uh, for the purposes of speeding it up. Uh, this is typically a web page that gets refreshed to show where the pig is. But if I just run this for about 30 seconds, we can actually plot real data from where the specifics are in terms of the speed and location of the pig how that correlates actually to flow that we're using from the exactly same fiber sensor uh, to, uh, to normalize. Um, and then actually plot the pig through uh, the right of way and uh, the pipeline through, in this case, obviously a Google Earth satellite map. What's interesting about this uh, example here is that we can see these very pronounced slowdowns of the pig, which highly correlate to a change in flow that we're also sensing on the pipe itself. In this case, we actually had a stoppage for a point in time where, again, flow was very, very low at that specific time. It actually freed itself up and continued, but what is interesting about that is if it didn't free itself up, we would have an immediate instance of knowing exactly where that pig has been stuck and where uh, we can actually have the pipeline operator send crews to. Um, we can then do a variety of different pig run analyses around this. So, you know, just using the optical data from the pig traveling through those weld joints, we can run a variety of different uh, pieces. This is not optical data over here, by the way. Um, so I know it looks fairly pixelated. What these are, are actually comparing average strain by repetitive pig runs, one almost every week, as you can see. You can see every run is a little bit dynamic, a little bit different. And so we can show those specifics where uh, locations, segments uh, on the pipeline are creating uh, changes in time. We can actually run uh, accumulated average cumulative strain for each pig run in, to, uh, in its uh, totality, and then run, of course, timing against that as well, and provide this as very interesting data and statistics back to the pipeline operator to be able to, uh, to manage pig runs and understand what might be going on with, uh, uh, with their pigging operations. As you see, we're doing a lot of this type of work now, and we've actually applied for a patent uh, around pig detection, tracking, and analysis techniques. Moving then into uh, other applications, uh, we can actually provide uh, capabilities around uh, pressure anomalies, as an example, getting more into flow. Uh, again, here we're actually providing a couple different plots of strain. This is actually the same data, both 2D and 3D. You can actually see the propagating strain um, from normal flow. The, the flow pressure line up here is actually provided to us from the, the pipeline operator which is great because this provides this machine learning, supervised machine learning capabilities that we can use to develop the algorithms that actually can then start flagging where there may be flow anomalies, in this case, uh, a pressure event here. And so this could be due to paraffin buildup, could be debris, but otherwise this type of data on a distributed basis uh, can be provided and alerted back to the pipeline operator in real time when they've got these sort of signatures uh, that could be um, uh, signs of potential other issues. Um, other examples of, of evolving into flow monitoring itself. Uh, again, we can use uh, data here to correlate what we're picking up from both acoustics and strain, in, the, in this case, just, uh, just acoustics, um, 
but we can actually model again supervised machine learning against production flow data that we can provide back from the operator and turn the actual fiber optic sensor not just into a leak detection capability but one can also be man, uh, used to monitor and manage flow monitoring as well very much in complement with uh, with flow meters and so we can evolve this even a little bit further to show this example where this is output directly from the SCADA system from a pipeline operator on a 36 inch pipeline you can see these set point changes here where we have start stops um, we can actually then show the fiber um, data that has been estimated out of this uh, again supervised learning based energy propagation algorithm that we've constructed to estimate what the flow rate is on that same um, uh, same pipeline at the exact same time what's very interesting is that if we then overlay the two we actually are able to create quite a bit of a uh, high correlation of the fiber data from the flow rate data and then again a very good example of what we call function fitting uh, based unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning in this specific example so the idea here is geez we can use the fiber sensor data to be operating at a, as a distributed flow monitor as well and we did announce a patent on this about a year ago so we've we've certainly made uh, lots of progression here but uh, the idea would be that we can actually provide this as data back to the operator and provide a tremendous amount of uh, distributed based data to complement what they have from uh, conventional flow data um, from their flow meters finally i just want to show a couple uh, examples of how, you know software interface key challenge here is how do we get all this data and actually present it uh, in real time in a logical way that's consistent with pipeline control room operations um, so there's a, a variety of different uh, uh, discrete examples of just showing heads up displays on a variety of events you can see this map here we've got construction event a leak event intrusion these are by the way uh, uh, mock events that we're using with testing uh, we can allow the operator to drill down into some of these examples to see the context and in, in this case an intrusion alarm to show where on mile post markers or kilometer post markers are in context of other assets like pumps and valves and especially if there's other events that may be clustered together uh, other examples here we can again show this on a satellite version instead of a, a map of course uh, here just another heads up display showing in this case an acoustic uh, alarm a flow anomaly type of alarm uh, again operators can drill in a little bit further not just see the schematic but get into data uh, itself the signatures of audio we could actually replay uh, the wave file effectively in in, uh, uh, in real time for the control room operator or analyst um, and in this case allow them to drive deeper into say history where they could create filtering and customized reporting based on uh, all the alarms that have been uh, received uh, or alerts that have been received um, uh, historically on that event. So again, we've got leak events, intrusion, construction strain, vehicles detected. And then the analyst level can actually drill into very specific signatures uh, that we've shown a couple examples here, both on strain and acoustics and temperature for that matter, um, on what's going on with every one of these specific events and what is the correlated data to help illustrate what, uh, what the situation has been. So in summary, uh, very excited uh, to be in the pipeline world and distributed fiber optic sensing. Uh, I think we've been uh, good at being able to show how effectively utilized it can be uh, for preventative pipeline uh, leak detection itself, but we can also provide that same high fidelity sensing for other um, value added applications that are more pipeline integrity related. The pick detection tracking and analysis uh, aspects, real time and cumulative strain, as well as security monitoring, other applications such as evolving directly to uh, to flow uh, flow monitoring, it really does strengthen the overall business case for the investment in technology. It's not just about leak detection; it is about supporting a variety of these other applications. And we actually do see a day where deployment of the technology is actually justified from an operational based set of applications, which, oh, by the way, it also provides direct leak detection as well. Uh, just wanted to provide a, a big thank you and, and highlight a, a subset of some of the partners that we've worked with. Um, obviously, this is a range of predominantly oil and gas based pipeline operators and midstream operators, uh, but they also do include non hydrocarbon based pipeline operators as well uh, in mining and even potable water utilities as well. And so with that, uh, we thank you for your time. I think we're about 45 minutes into our hour, so we've uh, allotted about uh, 10 or 15 minutes for, for questions. 
Uh, thank you very much for your time. So, um, Mark, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Steve. And, and I think maybe our, our first question is a, a bit of a softball in, in light of the last slide, but I think I'll give you an opportunity to, to answer it. Uh, <clears throat> leak detection, uh, liquid detection is mentioned. Is the system good for gas and pipeline methane and upcoming hydrogen and hydrogen methane mixes? Uh, thanks. Gr great question. Uh, by the way, I'm also joined here by John Hall, our founder and chief technology officer. He's here to field the questions that are over uh, my pay grade. I, I can take this one. Uh, we, we are actually product agnostic and pipe agnostic, meaning that we have deployed on a variety of different pipe types, uh, steel, concrete coated, composite, um, uh, you name it, even pipe and pipe type of uh, configurations. We're also product agnostic. So we don't just do, as I just mentioned there, hydrocarbon-based uh, liquid environments. That is a, you know, a big bulk of what we do uh, by, by distance, but we do gas environments, multi-phase environments. Uh, we've done acid-based slurry environments, uh, wastewater environments. And as I just referenced, we've also done potable uh, environments as well, where a water main carrying potable water or drink water uh, that has leaks or has integrity issues is, is really just a pipeline moving, in this case, potable water under pressure from point A to point B. Steve, I've got a number of questions related to the internal installation. So <clears throat> one question is, is how far can you go? I mean, what, what are the distances? What are the constraints on installation when you're inside a pipeline? Yeah, that I mean, it's, it's a great question. And as I mentioned there, it, it is really oriented around shorter high consequence areas. Uh, obviously, we're putting uh, the fiber sensor in a stainless steel capillary tube. The longer the distance, the heavier that, that you know, that piece of material is going to be. However, we, we found that most of the uh, you know, existing high consequence areas that are of concern for pipeline integrity managers um, are things like existing river crossings where a valve to valve sort of distance may be in the order of magnitude of say 2000 meters. Um, and so it is quite well suited uh, for that. Going much longer distance uh, past that, there are certainly ways to do it. Uh, but certainly it creates more and more challenges just with the sheer amount of weight going inside the pipe. And I guess related to that issue of challenges is a question of uh, how do you run a pig when you have uh, a fiber embedded in the pipe? Yeah, I tried to comment on that a little bit. There's different types of pigs, right? So an inline inspection tool uh, is quite involved piece of machinery. Uh, but they're not run very often. And so in those instances, we actually have a retraction uh, procedure where we would actually pull the line out of place, uh, spool it back up. You can then run the inline inspection tool um, and, uh, and then redeploy the fiber sensor again using that, uh, that tow pig that I showed. That's really good for, let's say, a, a gas environment uh, where you're, you're running that uh, inline inspection tool, say, once a year. However, in like a heavy oil environment, you may be running a cleaning pig very often, every two weeks, as an example. That becomes much less practical to retract and redeploy. Uh, so one of the areas that we're working on is finding a way that we could actually have the fiber sensor and a pig, uh, cleaning pig, coexist. Uh, so we've been looking into having some custom designed pigs that allow uh, maybe not to squeeze the the uh, the fiber sensor into the in interior diameter or inside diameter of the pipe itself, um, instead of um, you know hugging it and allowing it to spin around it a little bit. So the next question is a little bit related to the issue of different materials are, are different to going through pipeline, in, in a reference to the high liquids uh, in. Um, uh, that in Alberta in particular, where I guess there's more erosion along the pipeline wall. So the question is, can the system detect this and give advance notice when sections of the pipe may be wearing thinner uh, more than the, the sort of design effect, the, the minimum design thickness, uh, and therefore give advance notice to a potential leak or failure? Yeah, great, great question. And it really does um, align back to our whole point of evolution to flow monitoring. It's not just being able to use the flow monitoring capabilities of the fiber sensor for commercial purposes like batch tracking and custody transfer. Uh, but while the fiber sensor itself is not going to be a direct corrosion um, based sensor, what it can do is start picking up flow anomalies. Again, coming back to that uh, for function fitting unsupervised uh, machine learning capability. If we start see, if we understand, the system understands what is normal flow, 
and we start seeing flow anomalies, uh, that may be one-time events, they could also be represented from early signs of corrosion that are going to show up as a pitting signature. Uh, so while we don't have this commercial, uh, this is you know something we are definitely aware of and excited about in terms of providing exactly what you referenced in your question, almost an early warning indicator that we may see early signs of corrosion because we're seeing a pitting signature in, in the in the normal as, as an or abnormal flow. That's interesting. So uh, for geotechnic monitoring, uh, where, where you use two fibers are used in comparison, is the fiber installed inside the pipe or outside the pipe or both? How do you how do you how do you do that? Yeah, that's independent of the the deployment method itself, whether that's external or internal to the pipe. We've had many internal deployments where we can still sense movement of the of the uh, the pipe. Especially gas environments are great for that because we do have a little bit of what we'll call hydrostatic sticking of the fiber sensor inside the pipe. In the example that we showed there, that was external. So we actually had the fiber was actually strapped to uh, or, or secured to the 12 o'clock position of the pipe. That was buried at around three meters or 10 feet. The second fiber was in a separate conduit that was buried about one meter or, or three feet. Uh, so the, the two were distinguishing pipe movement itself from ground movement. So my next question actually, essentially is the same from two different people. So uh, what type of fiber is being used? Is it commercially available or do you have uh, some specially designed or manufactured uh, fiber? Uh, yeah, it's John here. Um, so we we actually use specifically engineered fiber so we do a, a variety of things to standard telecom fiber to enhance it for sensing um so yeah so every everything that we do is 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 a engineered fiber and we should also point out we have multiple uh, manufacturers of our specialized fiber so it is certainly read, readily available I, and I think your reference, this is really a question to repeat something in the presentation, but you, could you repeat the smallest leak that you were able to detect? Uh, the smallest leak that we've detected in, in field testing was an orifice size of 0.7 millimeters at 6 PSI. Um, as you can imagine, you know, we have been tested and tested and tested in a variety of different types of environments uh, in the field, in the lab. Um, and so we've, we've seen you know, hundreds of, of leak signatures um, uh, that um, we've been able to kind of rely upon in our, in our leak database. That, that was the smallest one. There was, you know, arguably, you know, was it really a leak? Was it really a fluid release and something like that? Uh, but it was a signature that we were able to detect. I think the reliable uh, other statistic we provided there is with our direct method is that uh, we can be accurate down to 0.1 liter at 0.1 liter per minute. Now, perhaps this is a different application, but uh, have you used fiber optics to monitor pump vibration, acoustics, and temperature change? Uh, great question. Uh, directly, no, uh, is the answer, but we have had a variety of very interested part partners in doing other monitoring when you come around uh, either valve huts, uh, valve stations, and uh, uh, tank farms, and, um, uh, and uh, pump stations. Um, and so that gets into, you know, we're not just, you know, monitoring a linear deployment of the pipeline path, uh, but we're deviating off of that and whether we're monitoring or the potential to monitor uh, tank lines, um, tanks themselves, pumps, uh, and a variety of other different types of uh, components and assemblies. Um, so we've, we've started doing a little bit of investigation and testing on that and, and have done some early field deployments. Uh, and I think the next question is a kind of an opportunity to kind of expand, but the issue is uh, why is sensing integrated acoustics, strain, and temperature so important? So I guess kind of elaborate a little bit about how those all work together. Well, as as I pointed out in, in the uh, leak example, uh, you know, there's a high correlation to the acoustic signature of a leak and strain on the pipe. The same is true of our energy propagation algorithms that we're using for flow monitoring. We're actually integrating acoustics and vibration as part of that. Um, it, you know, if you're looking for alarm generation and being reliable on that, uh, you know, relying on just one of those measures uh, actually creates the potential of missing an event, 
uh, or creating false alarms that are just unique to that specific type of variable. So an example, if you're just doing acoustics, you can actually have uh, false alarms being, you know, faking out type of um, uh, um, events on the pipeline because they're just loud or happen to have the same kind of frequency of a potential leak. Um, whereas, you know, a lot, a lot of people will try to test pipeline leaks using a hydrovac. Uh, because we're actually blowing water down onto the, and that sounds very similar from a flow perspective. But if you're not creating a strain on the pipe, we're actually not mimicking what actually happens during a, a leak type of event. So that's exactly why things like uh, acoustics integrated with strain, um, and then even temperature. If you have heated uh, product as an example, that's going to start producing a, a temperature uh, signature, although a little bit later uh, after the event has occurred. In a gas environment, you're going get, to get a what's called a Joule-Thompson effect or cooling effect coming uh, out of the leak itself. So again, those multiple variables help us ensure that A, we're giving 100% accurate uh, alarms without uh, false positives. And I have a, a couple of installation related questions. So one is, is there more information about fiber optic injection? Uh, I think this is re relates to inside the pipeline with air or fluid pressure. Uh, and the other question related to that is how, when it's on the pipeline, how is it fastened? Um, how is the fiber fastened to the pipeline? How do you secure the conduit to the pipe? I guess a better way to explain that. Yeah, definitely two different questions there. I'll, I'll deal with them in reverse order. Uh, yeah, if you're doing the conduit at 12 o'clock position, to be honest, there's a variety of different ways to do it. We've seen uh, just pipeline tape uh, used. You saw that in, in a few of our uh, uh, picture examples. Uh, we've seen it secured with clips, with spray foam, um, even just sandbags. In, in fact, many deployments, you start the fill process, so you're shading the pipe, say, around to the 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock positions. The conduit is placed and secured at the 12 o'clock position just with sandbags. And then the construction contractor then can finish uh, fill and, uh, and just fill in over top of the, the sandbags. Again, securing uh, the conduit more or less at the, uh, at the 12 o'clock position. So that's the one part of the question. The second part is, I think, uh, around when we have an empty conduit and then we're injecting fiber after the fact. And we have a number of installation partners. We call them the Hi-Fi Academy. Uh, that help can help us do that uh, on a variety of different uh, deployments uh, worldwide. And then we can use a more standard air jetting uh, procedure that uh, has been used with telecom cables for years. Uh, but we also can use a liquid injection method where we literally float the fiber into tougher environments where they may be 90 degree bends uh, or elevation changes uh, or otherwise. It really eliminates the friction that's associated with the air jetting technique by using the liquid uh, injection technique. The next question is, is how do you manage maintenance pipeline cutouts? Is the fiber slack so that they don't have to cut the fiber or how does that, how does that handled? Yeah, the, the actual procedure for deploying uh, the conduit, uh, can't really see it very well from some of those pictures, but it is actually subtly S-curved on the pipe. You actually do want the ability for expansion and contraction through seasonal changes of temperature and otherwise uh, on uh, on the pipe and the pipe will settle over over time and over years as well so you want the ability to have some slack allowance in the conduit itself um, we have had exactly as you described there integrity digs uh, where a cutout section uh, is is excavated if, if there was pipeline tape used it's removed and because there's a little bit of that slack allowance it can be pulled out of the way um, and then redeployed after the ins uh, the integrity inspections been Well, I think we're actually coming up to the top of the hour. There are, uh, uh, frankly, a number of questions, uh, additional questions. Uh, so I would strongly encourage people to get in touch with you directly and you can kind of answer some of the more technical ones that we have. Um, the common question that we always get with webinars is uh, when will the webinar be available? And uh, I'm expecting that Joy will have this posted uh, both on the fiber optic sensing website uh, page uh, within a day or so, if not uh, later this afternoon, uh, and will also be available on our YouTube page. Um, and there's a, a lot of additional information. So Steve and also John, thank you very much for a very informative uh, webinar. We've really learned a lot about uh, uh, your approach uh, to fiber optic sensing. Thank you. And that Thanks very much, Mark. And that concludes the webinar.